when the companions, one of them, Hudayfa al Yaman, he said, After this good that has come to me and to us, shall there be some evil after it? Notice he didn't say, After I became fixed up, after I became Muslim. He said, No, after this good that has come to me, this good that has come to us, will there be evil after it? That's in the Sahih from a Muslim. So that shows that he understood it's not from him. All of the guidance that you have, all the fruits of faith, all these affairs, none of it is from you. And know that. Now finally, as a point, as, as, and I think it's a significant point, you'll hear a number of names that will come up whenever we're talking tafsir literature. One is Tawus, which means the peacock. But it's a name. Tawus. And one is Muqatil. These are two of the greatest scholars of tafsir that ever lived. And they're both students of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, who is called the Tarjuman al-Qur'an, the commentator on the Qur'an. This is the same Ibn Abbas who the Prophet sallallahu held his head and he said, O oh Allah, give him the knowledge of the interpretation of the book and its wisdom and application. This is this one in Bukhari, in the Sahih of Bukhari. So Tawus is seen as the distillation of Ibn Abbas's understanding. And Muqatil is seen as the expansion because he expands more. And these two brilliant men are signs and symbols for us. So you'll hear their names come up frequently. Muqatil, and you'll hear Tawus, their names come up constantly. <clears throat> now, Imam ibn Jawzir rahimahullah, he then says, quote, And when the exalted one says, And do not consume your wealth among yourselves in falsehood. Now the falsehood here is that which is not permitted in the revealed law. Except, or the only way is, by means of commerce. Now, we've already discussed this matter before regarding tijara or commerce. And one can refer back to the commentary in Surah Al-Baqarah for further details on this matter. When the exalted one says, and do not kill yourselves. This verse has five applications to it. This verse has five applications to it. One is that the verse is held on its external form. Meaning that Allah has made it haram for the slave to kill himself. And this has been given as the outward form. Secondly, is that it means the slaves of Allah should not kill one another. And this is the statement of Ibn Abbas, Al-Hasan al-Basri, Sa'id ibn Jubayr, Ikrima ibn Abi Jahal, Qatada ibn Da'ima, As-Sudayy, Muqatil, and Ibn Qutayba. Thirdly, is that it means do not cause yourselves difficulty in working and commerce in which it may be it could lead to killing and fighting now this understanding has been narrated by Amr ibn al-As in the incident in Dhatu salasir when he prayed with his colleagues in a state of Junub. And it was on a cold night. So when that was mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, Amr, did you pray with your colleagues 
while you were in a state of junub? He said, Messenger of Allah, I had a wet dream on a cold night. And I thought for sure that I would be destroyed or suffer some harm if I should have made ghusl at that time. And I remembered the words of Allah. Do not kill yourselves. And the Messenger of Allah smiled at that point. And he did not say anything. Now, the fifth reason of what this ayah is referring to is don't kill yourselves because of the onset of major sins and disobedience. And the exalted one says, and whoever should do that out of enmity and oppression, meaning that i.e. should kill himself as referred to by Ibn Abbas and Ata and secondly that it returns to all of that which Allah has forbidden from from the beginning of the surah up until now so do not kill yourselves meaning by doing all of that which is from the beginning of the surah up until now. Now, this has also been mentioned from Ibn Abbas as well. Thirdly, it can also be killing oneself by consuming wealth in falsehood. And this is stated by Muqatil. Close quote. Now, this incident regarding Amr uh, ibn al-As is a significant one. For those who may not know, Amr ibn al-As is one of the great companions. There's a masjid in Egypt named after him. In fact, he's the one that brought Egypt under Islam. He's the one that brought Egypt under Islam. It is for his reason. It is for the reason that Allah used him why I'm sitting here talking to you today. And the rest of the Banu Kinana that came with him across... That is the reason why they spread from Arabia as mere cupbearers of the Kaaba and other things all the way into South Egypt. And so that is the reason why I'm sitting here talking to you today. Ahmed ibn al-As was also referred to at times as the fox, the Tha'lab, because of his intelligence in battle and his ability to outwit seemingly uh, impossible odds. And Khalid bin al-Walid used to like to send him into battles undersupplied to see what he would do. Because he knew how brilliant he was and what type of character he had. He, he had such a way of finding the solutions to problems. He would just marvel at what he would do. Let's send him in and see what Amr does. And whenever Amr was in charge, they'd always find some way around, around things. Now, this story of Amr ibn al-As... Someone with a basic knowledge of fiqh <clears throat> would say to themselves, now just a moment here, what exactly went on here? Because we know, fiqh-wise, what is junub? Junub is when someone has had either menstrual blood, a huge amount of najasa, semen, or any such nejis material exit from their body in large quantity. This is what leads to the state of junub. 
And we know one of the things when a person is in a state of junub is they can't pray. But I just quoted this hadith to you that's in Bukhari. And it says right here that he was with them when he was junub. Hadith is in Bukhari. It's in the Musnad. It's in uh, the Sunan of Imam al-Bayhaqi, a Sunan al-Kubra. How do we reconcile this thing? Here is how we reconcile it. And it's an important thing to keep in mind. The Jami'u Sahih collections, and I want you to hear this very carefully because I have to state it very carefully. The Jami'u Sahih collections, Jami'u Sahih by Imam Muslim, Jami'u Sahih by Imam Bukhari, the Jami'a of Imam at tirmidhi the Jami'a of Ibn Hibban and others. Those collections, what those authors did is they quoted sections of bigger hadith from the early generations. They quoted sections of them, extracts of them. And the points that they quoted were the relevant issues for the particular fiqh to which they belonged. So when someone reads the Jami'u Sunan by Imam Tirmidhi, they say to themselves, Subhanallah, for some reason, all the rulings in here, most of the rulings in here match with the madhab of Imam Shafi'i. Yes, fancy that. Well, that's to do with the man, the fact that he was Shafi'i. If someone goes, they read Bukhari, Muslim Abu Dawood. Well, Subhanallah, look at that. Well, the fatawa, the vast majority of the fatawa match with Imam Ahmed in Hanbali school. Yeah, because they are. Because they were. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood. Tirmidhi ibn Majid, Nisa'i, they were Shafi'is. That's why the fatawa matched. Now, when you look in Bukhari and those books, and they give you fiqhi masail, you go back to the bigger books to get the larger chain and the whole hadith with the reason why that hadith was revealed. In Qur'an, the reason why an ayah is revealed is called asbabun nuzul the reason for the revelation of an ayah. In hadith, it's called asbabul wurud the reason why it was revealed. So what you do is you go back into the first three generations, because Bukhari is not from the first three generations, he's khalaf. You go back into the earlier generations, into the Musnad literature, the Musannaf literature, and all the other literature previous to them, and you look up this incident, where the full extract is shown in all of its pieces and parts. And you read the entire train of transmission, how it happened, what transpired, and then after that you find out what the full story was with all the chains of transmission. This is why you understand why the ulama keep telling you you don't read Bukhari by yourself and extract fatwas from it? Because you have to know the asbab al-wurud. Bukhari is assuming in there that you understand the asbab al-wurud. What this is about is Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an. This is after Baqarah was revealed. So it can't be the case that he did this. Baqarah was already revealed. So how do we, how do we, uh, how do we reconcile it? Here's how we reconcile it. The asbab al-wurud of this is that uh, Amr ibn al-As had an injury and an illness and he made a partial wudu and for the rest he did tayammu. He did a partial wudu and for the rest he did tayammu. That's what happened. So when he was in a state of janaba and he did a partial wudu for one part and a partial tayammu because of his illness. He was still, what happened is at that time when he had the wet dream and he was in a state of junub, he explained what happened in the rest of this hadith. The part, فَضَحِكَ رَسُولُ الله, that part is not the fullness of the rest of the hadith, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, laughed. That's not the fullness of the hadith. The rest of it explains what transpired later. That's why I wasn't told to pray again. Now you have to think, because you have to understand this. Because otherwise, someone that could read that hadith and say, Oh, subhanAllah, if the water in my shower is too cold, and I'm in a state of junub, subhanAllah, just pray as you are. Not even with wudu. No, that doesn't mean that at all. You have to understand the positioning and pointing behind this because it's impermissible for a prophet to have falsehood happen in front of him for him to not say anything. And you have to understand the asbab al-wurud 
of the particular hadith. And that happens with numerous hadith. Let me give you another one as an example. There's another hadith in Bukhari. Again, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whenever any one of you has suspicion in his prayer that he may have released something, he should not stop his prayer unless he has smelled something or heard something. Now there, now there are one or two people, one whom I met in my life, another who I heard about, one person I met in my life, he built a whole principle around that hadith. That whenever he used to break wind in the prayer and he didn't hear it, he didn't hear it or he didn't smell it, he used to continue praying. And that carried on for years until we met him and had a discussion with him about this matter. And a brother went on the shelf, pulled down Ibn Rajab and a Nawawi, and we broke him down and showed that that hadith was addressing a particular companion who used to always have concerns because he would hear noises happening around him and he would be distracted and think that his prayer was broken. It had nothing to do at all with the external aspect of what he took from that hadith. So we kindly explained to him after that that he had about three or four years of salawat to make up because he nullified them with their association sunnah if, if it wasn't too hard on it. And it depends on which imam you say, because imams like Imam Buhuti should say, he should still do them even if it's hard on it. Whereas Imam Muafquddin said, no, you should be merciful because he might not want to do qada at all if he realizes how vast the number is. But Imam Mansur al-Buhuti says, no, out of righteousness he should fear Allah, otherwise he wouldn't be a real Muslim anyway. So he should still do them. So you see, this is the thing. These types of statements, when you read them by themselves... You must understand the reason why things were revealed, the fiqh behind them. So when you read Bukhari and Muslim, we can take guidance from Bukhari and Muslim in terms of the aphorisms and the wisdoms and the judgments. That's true. I'm not saying never read Bukhari. But I'm saying don't read that which is in there. Take a ruling from it and then derive based upon it and then use that in your day-to-day -day life. Because you don't have the weight to deal with it. If you find something in there, well, this seems, this seems interesting. You find something in Bukhari. SubhanAllah, look at this. I didn't know that this was in here. And then you say, well, there it is. It's a clear hadith. <sighs> Throw the madhab against the wall. And we're off and running in the wind again. Well, maybe it's not that easy. Here it is. It says that the Prophet ﷺ only wiped over his head in the wudu. Well, therefore, going over the neck must be a bid'ah. Really? Did you know about the hadith in the in the, in the uh, awsat and the uh, the awsat and the azgar and the uh, a'zam of Imam Tabarani? Did you know about the hadith and all three of those collections? It mentions the wiping of the neck with both hands. Well, no, I didn't see that. Well, this is the thing. This is the thing. It's bigger than just you. Oh well, what about this hadith right here? Or what about this one right here? It says that you go over all the head in Bukhari. Yes, but did you see this other hadith that mentions that Uthman ibn Affan عنه, wiped over a quarter? See, it's, it's, it's bigger than that. So when you limit yourself in terms of trying to derive rulings or what have you from Bukhari or Muslim, and then you try to derive based upon that, where Bukhari doesn't give you the asbab al wurud and other things, you just start making judgments upon that when Bukhari makes certain assumptions in the book that he's written. Did you know that the introduction of Imams Muslim, Bukhari, and Abu Dawood in the, in the introduction to their hadith books, did you know that's not been translated? It's like if I wrote a book and someone decided, you know what, we don't need the introduction here. Why would you not translate how to use this book? The Shaykh is telling you, this is how you use the book. Ah, oh, we don't need that. Let's get straight back to the basics. That's like someone printing the Quran without Fatiha. What do you need this for? The whole instruction manual on how to use this book. So I'm saying is be careful about just misreading things. Imam Ibn Jawzi he says, quote, And when the exalted one says, And if you should avoid the major sins that you've been forbidden from. Now by avoiding something, it means leaving it out of terror and running from it. 